Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Butterfly Effect podcast. Today we are talking about heavy rain. It's our analysis for part five of uh, Liam's stream that he did a few weeks back. And we are starting off with a chapter called The Fugitive. Now, as you're all aware, this is actually the scene where there's three playable characters all in the same area together. And I just wanted to quickly pass a comment actually that I really like how Quantic Dream did this, how like they slowly brought all the stories together. We've already seen it a couple of times with Ethan and Norman meeting. We've seen it obviously with Ethan and uh, and Madison meeting. But yeah, as the game goes on slowly, everything's coming together. And I just think that's a really good example of storytelling. Um, from my end, I feel like I really like this scene. I know I've mentioned it in another video, but just like the whole escape, like the way it splits into different screens and you can see the police at the door and you've got QTEs, the music's really tense and you're thinking, oh God, like the, you know, the way the, the cut scenes are playing out, you think, are they gonna get caught? Like something's about to go down here. But mate, I'll, I'll throw it over to you to talk about like what happened in your playthrough and what other stuff can happen as well. Yeah, no, I agree. It is a really cool tense scene. It's the whole thing we always mention, how you have the different camera angles. Um, you got to say as well, I think Ethan is super lucky that he's got someone in his corner, this guardian angel in Madison, because I imagine a lot of the other dads that had missing kids probably didn't get that luxury, and no wonder they ended up dying in tunnels and stuff, because they didn't have, like, Madison to nurse and heal them up each time. Another thing I wanted to mention as well, actually, it's there's more parallels between this game and Detroit Become Human, because we obviously have, like, the scene where Kara runs, runs away from Connor, uh, and that, you know, chapter is equally uh, titled The Fugitive as well, I believe. So, yeah, it's, like, interesting how, like, it wasn't even a subtle kind of, like, parallel, it's just full-on almost the same, isn't it? But yeah, regardless of it, like in my scene, um, it's interesting. I've always aced this scene. Like back in the few playthroughs I've had in this game, I've always got through the subway. And it's a really cool scene where, you know, you do the classic thing where you jump on the train and then they miss you. And I was really looking forward to seeing that again. But I don't know if it's because it's like my first time playing Heavy Rain Mouse and Keyboard. But yeah, I, I got caught in the stream, lad. And uh the controls are quite awkward, like this game is quite notorious for having really difficult controls. Like back in the day on the PlayStation you actually have to hold R2 to walk around, it's really odd. Um, but I, I think it's the camera angles that get you, because right when you've got to like weave through that first car, um, yeah like the camera switches and then I ended up like turning back and then I like lost my bearings because the camera completely sways. And then yeah, like Blake's there and I just was like, oh, for fuck's sake, because I, I just had the streak of never getting caught with this bit, and then I did, but equally, not the worst thing, mate, because if you do get caught, you do get a bonus scene, so. Yeah, because actually I was quite surprised to see how much variation there was, but I did want to quickly ask you about something from a little bit before, so, you know when uh, Ethan and Madison are both in the warehouse, are you actually against the clock or is it that you've actually got infinite time until you both get outside of the window or can they actually be caught before they even leave? It's a good question and realistically mate it's one I do not know. I've not tested the waters to do that. I always jump out the window and then I get caught later but yeah I imagine so. I imagine they probably have covered that basis because Quantic Dream are really good like that so yeah but I will have to look into that. Oh, fair dues. I wanted to quickly say so as well, because if you haven't been watching this series, you'll know that I'll come in with like little bits of trivia about this game. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of trivia, lad. So according to the project manager, Charles Coutier, a scene was planned where Madison and Ethan would have had to move between subway cars with Jaden and Blake pursuing them, which actually ties in nicely to something you said before, actually. But the concept was then repurposed for a scene in Beyond Two Souls in which Jody must escape from a train whilst being chased by the police. Does does that ring a bell to you? It does, yeah. It's one of the mo most iconic scenes in that game, to be honest. So yeah, big time. Oh, amazing, because the thing is, it's good then that obviously there's things that they, you know, juggle around and bring back into games, but there are ideas that they sort of keep to one side and then actually repurpose in other games as well, which I think is actually quite good. And the next bit of trivia, I think I alluded to this in the last part actually, but Ethan will be shot in the shoulder after escaping into the alley if he failed the third trial. Otherwise, the officer will not shoot him. Whether or not he is shot does not impact his ability to successfully escape. Oh, very well. I mean, we'll now move on after the fugitive 
So now, obviously, in your gameplay, mate, you did get caught. There was this bonus scene uh, where Norman, I mean, he's sort of showing some Blake characteristics at the start, isn't he? He's like getting really forceful with Ethan in the interrogation. Um, although he does still hold some reservations in the sense that he actually thinks that Ethan is the origami killer. We see him go out and confront Perry about it, who, by the way, is like far too casual to be in the position he's in. He just seems to be just like Blake in the sense that he doesn't care who's really taken down for it. He just wants to get someone labelled as the origami killer, so probably he could just make it look like a good number on his books. Um, but yeah, just take us away, mate. This scene in general, what are your overall thoughts on the characters and the way things are developing? Yeah, you know what? It was really interesting because like most of the game, I'm like, oh, don't worry, guys, I'm a pro at Heavy Rain. I know exactly where to go. This is my first time playing this scene. And I knew you could get there because I had seen like brief video snippets of like, you know, Ethan being caught and then Norman freeing him. But I didn't know anything else. So I was like, oh, my God, how where do I find the keys to like the guys, you know, on the guy's desk? Um, and then, yeah, like, well, like you mentioned, I never knew that about Captain Perry, like how corrupt he actually was. He's pretty much the same as Blake. Like you go in there thinking, oh, yeah, go to like Blake's superior to tell him off. And then he's like, now nah, you've got to like, you know, break a few eggs to make an omelette. And then later on, he mentions like, oh, the guy's dead to rights. Um, and then he almost only cares about what the press thinks. And I'm like, wow, this guy that, you know, we think we can trust is just absolutely corrupt. Um, so yeah, no, it, it was really interesting. I found it quite challenging as well. And um, once again, it's really interesting to get like another trick to cane scare as well, uh, which like, you know, is this common theme Norman's dealing with. But yeah, no, um, weirdly, probably a good thing I actually failed the earlier scene because it was a pleasure to play this. I wanted to ask you as well, I've just looked this up. Really interesting. I did not know about this at all. Uh, but there's a trophy, it's called Wise Guy. And it says, turn off the video camera before freeing Ethan. I just wondered, that. did you do that? Uh, I think I did. I, I can't remember. And I guess I'll find out later when I edit it. But I actually have seen videos where people did that. So at least I knew you could do it. Whether I did it myself is another matter. Because I sort of now think, I mean, you know, especially how good Contact Dream are good with their branching. Like, does that come into play later on? Like, can... Norman gets some heat because obviously he's let Ethan go. It's all on camera. Like, I'm really intrigued now because obviously my playthrough, Norman died with the trip to Kane. Like, he didn't make it near to the end. So, I'm starting to think like how Norman's story could play out. So, that's certainly one I'm going to be keeping an eye on. And then, following this, we do have a little cutscene where Norman is playing the piano and a waiter, bearing in mind that this guy, Norman, is an FBI agent. Some bog standard waiter just comes up to him and starts giving him advice on to do his job and like I just find that like I find that so hilarious and just so embarrassing, you know. I think he's just sort of hinting him what, what what next steps to take, wasn't he? Um and then also there's actually a nice little hint about not doing the trip to Kane. I think that's almost a hint from Quantic Dream to the player that Norman can die soon. Um, but ultimately, he goes and looks at the evidence, doesn't he? And then helps Ethan escape. But what I wanted to ask you, mate, is basically, like, when you played this blind, how did you feel about being forced as Ethan... Sorry, not Ethan, Norman, to, like, help Ethan escape? Um, yeah, it's weird, because I never sort of saw myself in that predicament, but I guess it's just something you would do. Like, you almost feel bad that you've got to go to that level of, like, going against the cops. But when you see how corrupt they are around you it almost just you almost have that mindset like nah this has to happen because you just know ethan's innocent like he just he can't be the killer despite the fact it's not confirmed yet and it is a potential avenue it would have been interesting if it was him and then you feel guilty for letting him go felt a little convoluted as well though because the way he gets out is just a bit awkward like he put a coat over his head and then he just walks out like no security in the police precinct yeah. are gonna question that but regardless, it has to happen. It's one of those ones where it's cool that if you mess up somewhere, you know, there's that scene as a bonus scene to kind of help you around that. So I think Quantic Dream did the best with what they could. You mentioned before about how like Ethan and Madison can then like meet up again. And I've actually got some notes on it here because in your playthrough, they do meet up at the motel. And again, like this is just something I've noticed multiple times now. 
it does feel like that these motel scenes are incredibly repetitive. I know they're a nice break from like the main events of the game, but like, how many more times is Ethan gonna like ask Madison to leave, but then she just keeps coming back like time after time? Because it feels like it's happened like three times now. And I'm like, Jesus, like, this girl just does not want to take a hint. But at the same time, it's just as well because Ethan's been banging trouble like quite a lot. Yeah, I guess it like makes sense from that like, you know, persistent journalist point of view. Like maybe Madison wants that story. And then as we like kind of grow to learn, like she eventually cares more about Ethan than the case. But yeah, no, I, I do fully get you. And like I say, I, I always had those reservations about her, like just being like a nurse. And, and luckily, like after this chapter, Madison gets some really cool scenes. But yeah, like interesting. One thing I do like about this chapter though is that like Ethan has that little bit of self-awareness about him. Like I think I'm the origami killer. But it's really interesting because he's like, I clearly have an alter ego, but I need to capture my son, then I'll turn myself in. So it's really cool that like, I mean, it does that thing where you're like, well, clearly if he's naming himself as a suspect, he probably won't be because like rarely a crime will like be that on the nose. Like, you know, like in terms of game and mystery. But it is really cool just to see like Ethan's thought processing kind of like go this forward where he's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to hand myself in, but I've got to get my own son, which kind of speaks like, you know, levels about how far he really is, you know, willing to like save his own son. Like he is actually at the point now where he's like, I'm going to save my kid, but then I'm going to turn myself in. So yeah, interesting dynamic. We're now going to move on to the next scene with Scott Shelby. Now I'm going to let you lead on this, mate. It's... Manfred's it's man Manfred's antiques right the name of the shop and I've got a quote here you said it's perhaps the dumbest chapter in the game so there you go mate you've got the floor take it away oh Jesus Christ like it, it might be that this merits its own video for why I hate this chapter so much now I tried to do a bit of research to understand it better and there's still bits I don't quite understand but I am fully aware that I might be lacking certain points here so in the comments guys please correct me if you can kind of fill in the gaps as to like why this chapter exists honestly so the first dumb thing to mention right oh strap in because you know we're in for a bumpy ride at this point in the analysis right um the first thing you've got to highlight is, is the fingerprints like he, he's wiping like the bottle and the glass and then he's holding it with his other hand so he puts them right back down leaving fingerprints on them anyway now i know it's cool from the achievement point of view that you have to kind of remember what was touched and there's like some awkward ones that might catch you out like the door handle or like you know the phone or the ballerina thing that you know lauren touches but still it's just that's dumb um, obviously guys, spoiler, don't, you know, progress any further because, you know, I'm going to go into like the big twist in the game to kind of get my point across here. But everyone he visits, whether it's Hassan or um, Susan Bowles, not Susan Boyle, um, there's a reason he's going there. He's recollecting the evidence. He's a PI. Those scenes make sense and they're fantastic for the ultimate twist. This one doesn't. He's going to a shop to look into like a font for a typewriter which inevitably he owns because he's the killer so like why is he here like i imagine to throw lauren off the scent but is it really that necessary to go to a whole shop where you end up killing a guy leaving your fingerprints everywhere and then even risking it further by calling the cops um so like yeah that just seemed really weird that why you would take Lauren along as well is beyond me. So yeah, I, I just really don't understand the scene. Um, and I, I think it's a really poor way of tricking the audience into like, you know, Scott discovering the body and then acting shocked. Like, oh my God, there's a dead body here. When later on we reveal he's the one who did it anyway. So like, there's almost just a bit of play acting there just to throw the audience off the scent in a really cheap manner. And um, another thing as well, Jack, you mentioned the flaws uh, with like when you hold down the right click button and you can get the character's thoughts. One of them is, oh, what's taking Manfred so long? It's like, you fucking know why, because you've killed the guy. So it's almost just like really dumb that like, you know, some of the thoughts actually really do like become flawed because they don't make sense. Um, I guess like one reason like, 
he probably does bring Lauren along is because like there is this theory that there is this romantic angle here and potentially he cares about her because he might potentially remind um, her of her mum and Shepard who lost a kid. So maybe she he feels a bit of grief there, but at the same time, like it's dumb because he's the one going out killing these kids to trial these dads. So yeah, like it's just like Scott's scenes are so epic and they've always made sense up until this point where when you look back at the twist, it's just so convoluted and so risky and it doesn't make any sense. The only like possible thing good I can say about this chapter is I quite like the shop de design and the clock sounds in the background are really unique and cool. And um, I, I really like the fact as well, if you do leave a fingerprint, which um, you won't see from my stream because I managed to do it perfectly with the help from my fans, but there is a cool bonus scene where Scott can get caught and go back into the police scene, uh, into the police station where they find his prints and they question him. And he gets away with it really easily. But yeah, like um, just a really stupid scene. And I would love for people in like, you know, the comments to maybe prove me wrong because I'm open minded as to why this actually might be a good scene. But from a surface level, from what I can see, I just don't understand it and the whole thing's just dumb. So yeah, mate, ran over. I didn't know that. I didn't know that if you screw up the fingerprints, he does actually end up at the police station. That's really cool. I want to see that back now because I didn't know that the branching would take it to that particular point. But honestly, what you were saying, it makes complete sense. Like the the plot here really does start to wobble in terms of like the realistic thing of him being the killer. Like I like the way the camera sort of convened. I mean, obviously we know why it does it, but the camera conveniently cuts to Lauren at one point, just inspecting some random thing. And the next thing you know, oh my God, the guy at the back, he's dead. But it does make you think to yourself, like how on earth has, if it's not Scott, how on earth has the killer got in killed the guy without making any sound at all and then got back out again so it's a little bit of a shot in the foot it's i think it's the first point that i'm gonna like perhaps criticize sort of like the writing here in quantic dream because yeah it's it didn't it didn't stand up very well and it doesn't to this point i think as well right am i right in thinking sorry that he goes there to get the book right of the list of names of people who've bought a royal five typewriter and yeah. Manfred's gonna give him the book anyway, so like, why kill him? I get like, maybe he's like, <laughs> a suspect who can give your name out as to, oh, Scott came here earlier and gave this book out in case the police ever find that lead, so maybe that's why it happened. And then eventually we do know he burns the evidence, but still though, it's just like, surely there's a better way, a less risky way than having to go through murder. I don't know, I just, not a fan. And that's the thing, like, was it uh, an impromptu thing? Did he have the intention to go in there to kill him? Because again, like Lauren was with him, like that was a very, very big risk on his end. And the fact that then Lauren would have to buy the fact that it wasn't him that did it as well. So yeah, it is very puzzling. But what I was going to say is I really do like the puzzle element in this one with the having to remember, like to retrace your steps to go and wipe all the fingerprints. And obviously you feel like you're against the clock as well because the police are going to come and stuff like that. So it certainly, from a plot standpoint, does have its negatives, but as always with like these games, like it does have its merits in place as well. So I'm just going to quickly run for a couple of bits of trivia here. Um, so you guys probably know this, but if Scott doesn't answer the phone after the sixth ring, Lauren will do it herself, which I'm pretty sure is what happened in your gameplay, lad. Um, and then it says here, if Scott forgets to clean something in Manford's shop and is subsequently sent to the police station, it is implied that he and Carter Blake know each other. It's possible that they used to work together in the police force before Scott became a private investigator. So yeah, there we go with the trivia for the chapter Manfred. And we're now going to move on. We're going to go back to Ethan because it's time for trial four. Um, I don't know the name of it. Uh, the, shark. the shark yes the shark this is simple right it's would you kill someone to save your son now how this plays out is of course that he basically assumes that you're a bit of a drug dealer right or a bit of a junkie a bit of a waste of space so if you were going to spare him at that point then I don't know. Maybe you quickly swayed as soon as he pulls out the shotgun, mate. So I want to, I want to almost know what your thinking was going into that scene. Like, was you gonna spare him? Was you always gonna kill him? 
Uh, so it's interesting. Like, I, I really wish I played this game before I watched it online because, you know, as I've constantly mentioned, I didn't have a PS3 at the time when the game came out. So I think it was PewDiePie I watched uh, at this point, Blind Player, and he eventually was like, nah, I'm not killing the guy. And I think the swaying factor is, is that, like, before, you know, it finds out he's out of bullets and he tried to kill you, he gets a photo of his, like, daughter's out or something, and you are in a kid's bedroom, so it's, like, the fact that this guy is almost, like, in your position as well, where he has his own kids, and it's, like, is it really worth kind of, like, getting what you want but like at the price of someone else losing what they have. So it's like kind of like a really interesting like philosophical conversation there itself. But ultimately I kind of agreed with PewDiePie at the time. And I think that when I did my own playthrough, I didn't do it myself. Um, so like I wouldn't. Then again, I played this in our stream mate and our fans are some fucked up individuals. <laughs> they really disturbed. There was like seven of us in the stream at the time and I was like, we'll take it to a vote and within a second five of them were like, shoot, do it, do it. And I was like, well, the other two, their vote doesn't even count. They're going to get outvoted. Uh, so we've got a yes, we've got a kill. kill. Yes, okay. Do oh my God. I you guys. Yeah. Well, there's no point even carrying on the vote. No, we're not coming back from that. There's seven viewers right now. And we've got five yeses, so... Bang! I'm a father too. So we ended up doing it, you know. It's pretty funny seeing um, Ethan puke all over the room. I don't think it matters in terms of leaving evidence and, like, DNA anyway, because he's already prime suspect at that point. But, yeah, like, um... So, so yeah, really interesting. Uh, one thing I wanted to tell you as well, mate, in case you didn't know, is that when I did watch that PewDiePie playthrough where, you know, out of the five trials, he ended up only doing four of them, uh, the hangman at the end can give you multiple locations to like locations it could be and you end up having to like pick one and if you guess the wrong one Ethan doesn't end up at like you know the finale scene which is pretty cool uh, but yeah so uh, in a nutshell if I was to play the game myself I wouldn't shoot but <laughs> in the stream I did uh, fair enough I mean as for me like general comments first of all it, the guy's name's Brad apparently I'm looking here on the heavy rain wiki He's a terrible shot. Like the guy's got a shotgun. He must how many how many times he must shoot Ethan and not hit him. But this does lead me nicely onto the trivia. So apparently Ethan cannot die in this chapter. Um, basically, what happens is if you fail too many QTEs, uh, Brad just throws you out of the apartment and tells him to go die somewhere else. So presumably that would then signal that you've failed the chapter. But nonetheless, you do get an achievement either way. So whether you kill him or whether you don't, you get an achievement. So that's a nice, a nice bit of rewarding and branching for the players there. Potential flaw for this chapter as well, mate. You know how we mentioned, uh, like, if other dads who are being trialed by this killer uh, end up trying these trials. So for example, like we mentioned the floor with the bear that does Scott have to like constantly check in a new car every time? Uh, like with the butterfly, does someone have to keep going through these electrical plants or whatever? Um, with this one, I wonder like if it's the same killer. Cause like, imagine if like Hassan rocks up to this guy's door and then like Mr. Bowles rocks up to this guy's door and then loads of other dads. Is this guy just constantly <laughs> gonna get like trialed fathers rocking up? And if not, does Scott have to like get different like killers or like different like drug dealers that he just thinks are like low lice that he wants to bust? So yeah, maybe a little bit of a flaw there, but you know, it's one of those nitpicky things that you know to to get the game going. Like I, I guess you can forgive it. That's so true. Like that guy must be stood there thinking, "Wow, someone must have a serious grudge against me." <laughs> Again, <laughs> there's all these random blokes turning up at my door, like ready to like, fucking throw fists at me, like whatever. But oh god. <laughs> Oh, that's so true and hilarious. I didn't even think of that. But yeah, I mean, yeah. And as far as like other trivia goes, I'll read one out for you. So according to an interview with Pascal Langdow, obviously voiced Ethan, the development, team, the, the development team initially debated on how violent Ethan could be during this chapter. Langdow argued that Ethan pistol whipping Brad if he spares him was reasonable because Ethan isn't particularly happy about being chased through the apartment and shot at. So yeah, like it's, again, like, 
In terms of like behind the scenes things, it's really interesting that even like the voice actors can like have their own say on like how things pan out in the plot as well. So yeah, thought I'd raise that one. Uh, and we're now going to move on to, I mean, one of Madison's best chapters in my eyes. We've already compared it against the taxidermist, but this is called The Dock. So remind me, mate, am I right in saying this, that it's he owns the apartment that Ethan had trial three in, where he cut off his finger, and that was the lead to get there, yeah? Yeah, bang on, mate. Sweet. So, I mean, yeah, honestly, mate, take the floor. Tell us about your playthrough with the dot. Firstly, I think it goes without saying, thank God we don't have Nurse Madison and she's finally getting a really cool chapter to herself. And it must be cool as well because you're probably playing, oh, it's just a nurse character. And when she finally breaks away and tries to, you know, finally go for that, like, kind of investigative, like, journalist kind of like, trials that we kind of wanted out of her for so long, we're finally getting it. Um... Yeah, I absolutely love this uh, this scene. Like, it wasn't until we played the taxidermist that is like, I like, you know, I it's the first time I've heard negative things about this chapter. Because yeah, you could argue this is weaker than the taxidermist because the taxidermist has like more endings, more branching. But still, though, like from a blind perspective, and I still don't think it takes away the fact that this is a really incredible scene. Um, <laughs> very kind of like. We mentioned in like, you know, the parallels with Detroit Become Human, you could say like the shark, you've got Zlatko missing the gunshots on car everywhere. And the dock is just the same with, you know, him tying Madison up, basically, the way Zlatko ties Kara up. But yeah, like really chilling, like the way that, you know, he makes you the drink and um, there's different ways he can get you down in the basement. He can spike you with the drink so you can end up fainting down there or you can be too snoopy and then he can hit you in the back of the head. Um, Really cool variation as well, I don't know if you knew this mate, but while he's going away to like get the meds for you, you can get the Blue Lagoon lead and then bounce out the front door. You, you know, so like you leave him in the house like alive, but you also escape unscathed. And then that can actually trigger this really epic bonus ending, which we'll talk later about, you know, more about like when we get to like the final analysis series, I'm sure. But yeah, like I love everything about this chapter, it's so tense. Um, one comment that made me laugh in my stream is the fact that you will ultimately get saved by like someone with a bible wanting to you know <laughs> knock on the door and then talk about jesus christ and then someone commented divine intervention which made me chuckle i thought that was a really good comment um but yeah like not only is it really tense how you're tied up and you think oh god like how am i getting out of this one but the fight scene is really cool as well. Like, I love the, like, final bit at the end where, like, you think Madison might have died because, like, you might fail a QTE. And then the fact that she plays dead and then ultimately drills him. And it's so rewarding because this guy's clearly this, like, creepy, murder, rapey guy. And it's just cool just to, like, as a female character, just get your own back a little bit and really stick it to the guy. So, yeah, like, um, yeah, I absolutely really like this chapter, mate. How about yourself? I really like it as well and it's when you say that because i didn't know that you could actually just grab the thing and then leave before anything goes down so again very similar to the taxidermist because you can leave before it even turns up right so um yeah i thought it was really good really they're so good at, <laughs> again i'll come back to this point of like middle-aged men receding hairlines but just like making villains like the quantic dream team and uh my poet i didn't know it and um, this, the doc is certainly one of them. Like, he just, as soon as you see the guy, you feel on edge, don't you? And the way his voice and offering you the drink and the way he's like touching you as you go to sit down, you think, oh, like this, this guy is definitely a creep. Um, but then the way it plays out, so good. Again, they really make the most of the whole split screen thing so that as you're messing around with the ropes, trying to get the drill in the right position to cut it, he's at the door with like the, with the guy selling the Bibles, really good, really tense stuff. And then you come up with like, this really nice fight scene as well. So yeah, honestly, it's definitely one of Madison's best chapters for me. Maybe her best, I'll have to see by the uh, by the end of this series. In terms of, yeah, in terms of the trivia, mate, you've already sort of said like the fact that you can leave early. Um, also as well, that obviously we do know that Madison can die here and they're quite brutal deaths. Whether, so it, whether it's by drill and there's some other electric tools that she can get killed by as well. So yeah, honestly, that's all I've got to say with, um, with that chapter. And we're gonna finish this analysis episode on another 
fight scene, another tense one where we could lose, potentially lose another one of our playable characters, we're back with Norman and he's going to see Mad Jack. Now, could you remind me, mate, what is the relevance of Mad Jack to this plot? Is it something to do with cars? It is. So, like, we know that this killer drives a stolen uh, Chevrolet Malibu, a blue one, I believe. And it was sold by Mad Jack, so you can find that evidence. So, Norman clearly, like, you know, breaks Ethan out and then goes to this lead to kind of see if he can get any kind of further clue himself this way. Okay, fair do. So, like, obviously the scene starts, Norman seems to have the upper hand, but then he has a bit of a moment. Um, after finding some clues, you can then see obviously a skull and then there's like a remnants of like a blood trail and then it all kicks off with Mad Jack. And I remember when I played this in my first, like my blind playthrough, this was one of the scenes where it felt, felt most tense. Not only just with the things that were going down, but especially on the back of where you've just had a fight scene with Madison and the doc as well. You almost expect, don't you, that you're going to have a scene where things start to calm down, but it, it really doesn't. It kicks off again very quickly. Um, and especially the bit as well, like where you're trapped in the car and you're about to get, you know, crushed in like the big machine. And I remember, I think even when we played, mate, there might have been a point. I might be doing myself a disservice here, but I'm pretty sure I vaguely remember you helping me out a little bit in terms of like what QTEs to hit, otherwise I'm Norman would have got crushed but yeah again a very iconic scene in this game um, in terms of like trophies one of them being is obviously defeating Mad Jack another one is called Nerd where you find all the clues in the garage so I'm guessing that is the bit where you find the skull and the blood trail right and I don't know if there's anything else unless you care to enlighten me lad yeah, no, that's the thing, mate. There is so much more. And I, like, if you're basing it on my stream, it's kind of one thing I regret that I messed up on because um, the moment you find the skull, that triggers the cutscene when Mad Jack starts fighting you. But there is, is like a hell of a lot in that warehouse to find. And it sucks because the skull is actually pretty early. Like, it's right by the entrance. So if you start by just backtracking and then doing it from like the door onwards, you can find the skull really early and then it triggers the cutscene. So I missed out on a lot of stuff. But there's, there's a lot of clues in there. I can't really remember them off the top of my head, but you, that's where you really start to learn that, like, this guy's more than just someone who, like, deals cars and sells them on kind of thing. That You know, this guy has a really shady, like, history with things like murder and manslaughter and stuff. Um, and then it's really cool in the dialogue that he reveals that the skull is, like, one of your cop, but your cop bodies that got a little too close, started asking too many questions, so he kills them. So, yeah, like... Uh, Bit of a shame that I like missed out on that because it would have been cool to see that. I pretty much sped around the whole thing. It's interesting as well because like the the car like um, compactor scene. I didn't really have a memory on how to go about it, but like I got through it pretty quickly, and I was like really lucky I did it the way I did. But yeah, like it's um it, it's such a good fight scene as well, and it's back to back. I love the fact that Madison can get her first death, and then Norman can die here as well. So there's probably people out there that probably killed two characters off in the space of like 10 minutes potentially. Uh, so yeah, like lots of praise for that. Um, I just like the fact as well that like the fight scene, like Mad Jack is like winning 80% of it. The QTEs are pretty much throwing stuff at him that he's not really being affected by. He's an, It's an absolute David versus Goliath battle and it makes it that much more rewarding that, you know, you end up getting the upper hand and killing the guy if you do that, of course. And... Yeah, a very gruesome death as well, which I was a big fan of. One thing I wanted to say, this is like a little trivia bit. It feels like it's an ongoing joke in this series now, but I've found it, so I'm going to have to raise it nonetheless. But depending on how you do with the QTEs in the fight with Mad Jack, uh, Norman can finish the scene with loads of bruises over his face, which I think is quite cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that is a wrap for uh, this episode for Heavy Rain Analysis. Uh, do let us know what you guys' playthroughs were like, what choices you made. Did you lose a character here? Like we said already, it's possible to lose Norman and... Uh, what's her name? Fuck, brain fart. Madison, Jesus Christ. I think it's just about coming to an end. Uh, in this episode, so yeah, is there anything you wanted to add, mate? Uh, usually I end it with like Jason or Sean, but I'm gonna say fuck the Manfred scene. <laughs> Fair enough, Ski. Catch you later, guys. See you soon.